Hi, in this video, we are going to solve another IGCS in computer science paper one, and the paper code is 047812, and this paper is Feb and March 2023. Let's begin solving the paper. Question number one: Computer can be infected with malware. Spyware is one example of malware. Tick one box to show a correct definition of spyware. We need to select the correct definition of spyware. Option A. Software that activates a webcam and transmits the video to a third party that output it live on a website. This definition is not correct. Option B. Software that detects when a password is being entered and then email the password to third parties. This is also incorrect. Option C. Software that record all data entered into a computer. Analyze this data to find email addresses and passwords then post these to a website. This is also incorrect. Let's see the option D. Software that record all key presses and transmit those to a third party. The option D is the correct one. Part B. Complete the table by identifying and describing two other examples of malware. For this one, I will show you my PPT and from the PPT, you can choose any two malwares and you can write them here. Let's see what is the malware. So malware refer to any software designed with malicious intent to disrupt computer or data. That is the basic definition of a malware. Now let's see what is a virus. A virus is a computer program that is downloaded onto your hard drive and replicate itself. That is the definition of the virus. It can corrupt your stored data or use up all the available memory in the computer, causing it to slow down and crash. Next type of malware is called the WOM. What is a WOM? WOM are self-replicating malicious program. They exploit vulnerabilities in networks. They consume significant network bandwidth and this lead to slowed network performance. That's all about the WOM. Let's move to the next type of malware and that is spyware. What is a spyware? Spyware monitor and record user's action on a computer. A prevalent form of spyware is keylogger, which logs the keystrokes. Captured data including key presses patterns is sent to the malicious actor for analysis and analyzing these patterns can expose personal information like the passwords leading to fraud and identity theft. Next type of malware is called the Trojan horse. A Trojan horse pretends to be a legitimate software or application. While appearing harmless, it secretly contains other malware. Uh, upon being downloaded and executed, it activates the hidden malware. This allows malicious actions like virus infection or spyware activities to initiate. Next type of malware is called the adware. What is adware? Adware generates unwanted pop-up and banner ads while browsing online. These ads are disturbing and can disrupt the user's experience. The prime motive behind the adware is monetary creators profit from the user engagement. Companies pay adware creator when users click on the displayed advertisement. Next type of malware is called the ransomware. Ransomware encrypt data on a device preventing user access. It demand a monetary ransom for decryption. Failure to pay may result in data leakage threat and the primary goal is financial gain at the expense of the victim's data. That's all about the different types of malware. You can choose any two and write the answer. Okay, let's move to the next question. Next question, option C. Proxy server and firewall have some similar functions. Identify two similarities and one difference between proxy server and firewall. Okay, first similarity, both can check incoming and outgoing traffic. Second similarity is both can block incoming and outgoing traffic. And third similarity is both can be hardware and software. Now let's see the differences. The first difference is proxy server can hide the user IP address. A firewall does not hide the user's IP address. Second difference is a proxy server intention is to divert attack from a server, while a firewall is to stop unauthorized access. And the third one is a proxy protects a server, while a firewall protects an individual computer. Okay, question number two. A programmer has designed a three-dimensional or 3D interactive computer game. They are going to develop a program for the game. The program needs to run efficiently, but it must also be developed as soon as possible. These are the two requirements. First requirement is the program should run efficiently. Second one is it must also be developed as soon as possible. Tick one box to identify whether the programmer should use a high-level language or the low-level language to develop the program. Explain the reason for your choice. For this case, since we need to develop the program as soon as possible, I will go with the high-level language. One of the reasons for choosing high-level language is it's easier for a programmer to read, write, understand, and edit the code. Therefore, the programmer is less likely to make mistakes. Second reason, the code written in high-level language is easier to debug. 
easier to find or correct error. The programmer can find and correct errors in less time because the high level language is more close to the human language like English. And the third reason will be the game will be machine independent. The game will be portable between the hardware. Okay, so you can write a code on one machine, then you can take that code to another machine and still work. And the last reason is the programmer can focus on the problem instead of the manipulation of memory or hardware. Because if we are using the low level language, we need to take care of how to efficiently use the memory and hardware. Okay, we are managing those things. But if we are writing code in the high level language, we don't need to care about those things. Option B, if a programmer choose a high level language, they can use a compiler or interpreter to translate the high level language in low level language. Describe the operation of a compiler and an interpreter. Let's see how the compiler and interpreter work. Interpreter and compilers are used to translate high level language program. If you write a program in high level language, for example, C, C++, Python or any other high level language, the translator job is to translate that code to the machine code so the computer can understand that code. There are two types of translator. First one is called the interpreter. Second one is called the compiler. An interpreter read one line of high level language code. Check that it is syntactically correct. Third step is if it is not correct, it stop and report an error to the user. If it is correct, it execute the statement and move to the next state. Okay, that is how the interpreter works. Let's see this example. This is the code editor. Okay, in this one, we are writing this code. This thing is the interpreter here. This is the machine code that will be generated and this machine code will be used by the CPU and CPU will then execute this code and we can see the output here in this window. Let's see. In the interpreter case, we run the first line of code. It will be converted to the machine code and CPU will execute this code and you will see the output here. So this is the first one. Next one, interpreter will convert this to the machine core and CPU will execute this one here and you will see the output here. So you can see here, we have a mistake here, right? It's the word print, the T is missing here. In case, if there is an error, okay, error is detected, you will execute this statement and it will show an error. Invalid syntax error to line 3 and it will stop running. Okay, that's how the interpreter works. It interprets each line of code separately and execute it, okay? Now let's see how the compiler works. A compiler check all the code by going through one line after other check all the code at once. If there are any syntax errors, they are all reported to the user and the program is not executed. If there is any error in the program, it will report that to the user and the program will not work. If there are no errors, then an executable file is created and an executable file uses intermediate or object code derived from the high level language code. Okay. So now let's see how this thing works. Similarly, we have the same code written in the high level language and we have a mistake here on line number two. Okay. Let's see how this thing works. Step number one, when you compile the code, the, the compiler will read all the code and convert all the code to the machine code. Okay, so let's see here, see the animation. Step number one, okay, compiled. Okay, line number two has an error. Okay, and then it will not execute anything here to just show you the error. You have an error on line two and it will stop executing the code. That's how the compiler works. Now let's go to the question number three. A new computer comes with a primary and secondary storage. Data storage is measured using binary denominations. Complete each conversion. We need to complete those conversions. Let's see how we can convert between the different measuring units. If you have a unit that is smaller, for example, if you have a data in bits and you need to convert it to a larger one. For example, you need to convert from bits to byte or from bits to KB byte or from bytes to maybe byte. Okay, you're going from smaller unit to the larger unit. So you just need to divide the number. Okay. For example, if you have data in bits and you need to convert it to byte, so you just divide the number by eight. If you have data in byte, you need to convert it to KB bytes and just divide it by 1024. And if you have a number larger and you need to go down okay for example if you have a number which is in gabby byte or maybe byte and you need to go down in this case you just multiply the number and you will get the answer okay now let's go back to the our question and see how we can do it question number one eight bytes is equal to how many nibbles we know one byte is equal to eight bits and one nibble is equal to four bits how many bits we have in 8 bytes? 8 multiplied by 2, we got the 16 nibble in 1 byte. The answer will be 16. Next one is the 512 KB byte into maybe byte. What we need to do, we just need to divide and divide by 1024 because KB byte is smaller and maybe byte is larger. The answer will be 0.5. Next one is 4 KB byte to maybe byte. KB byte is last year. Okay, we are going up to down, right? We need to multiply it. 4 multiply by 1024 and we get 4096. This can be the answer. Next one is the XD byte to Pebby byte. 1 XD byte is equal to 
10, 24 baby byte. Okay. I hope you got the idea how you can convert this. Okay, now let's move to the next question. Part B. Random access memory or RAM is an example of primary storage. Give P example of data that is commonly stored in the RAM. We know that all the programs that are running on the computer, they are stored inside the RAM, right? Let's see. First one is currently running parts of operating system. The, the part of operating system that are currently running, they're also stored in the RAM. Second one is the currently running application software. For example, you are using the Microsoft Word or Photoshop. All those programs that you are currently using, they're also stored inside the RAM. And third, currently running utility software. For example, if you have an antivirus software that is also stored inside the RAM, or if you have a compression utility, this will be also stored inside the RAM. These are the programs that are stored in the RAM. Option C, describe the purpose of secondary storage. What is secondary storage? Secondary storage is type of storage that store data for the long-term use. So what are the different types? For example, we have HDD or describe SSD and usb flash okay then we have cd uh, we have dvd etc these are the different types of secondary storage devices now what is the purpose of secondary storage devices we need the secondary storage devices to store data for the long term use second to store data to transfer it to another computer for example if you have some data on your windows laptop and you want to transfer it to your macbook you can use the secondary storage for example usb flash drive or CD or DVD and then copy the data to that first and then move it to the your MacBook. That's what we can use for this purpose also. Question number four. A wildlife photographer stored their digital images on a computer. Complete the table by defining each term about the image. First term is pixel. What is pixel? Pixel is individual dot used to represent a picture. So stand for the picture image. You can see this picture here, and this picture has small boxes, right? You can see all the small squares. The small screen can call them a pixel. Next one is the resolution. What is the resolution? The number of pixels used to represent a picture is called the resolution. Number of pixels, okay? And vertically and horizontally. Option B, one of the image has a resolution of 1000 by 1000 and the color depth of two bytes. Calculate the file size of the image. Give your answer in bytes. Okay. We need to calculate the size of the image and need, need to give the answer in bytes. Let's see how to calculate the file size of an image. We have a formula here, right? Resolution of the image multiplied by the color depth of the image and multiplied by the number of the image in the file. This is the formula that we can use to calculate the size of an image file. Okay. In this case, what is the resolution? We have resolution, this one here, right? 1000 by 1000. Where's is 1000 multiplied by 1000 okay and color depth is what two bytes two bytes and number of five we have one okay we just multiply all those numbers and we get a number this number okay this is a answer. next question the photographer decide to purchase a solid state storage device to back up their images complete the description of solid state storage use the terms from the list some terms in the list will not be used and you should only use a term once. Okay, this is the information. Let's see. For the first term, we have the binary, denary, electron, grid, neutrons, non-volatile, RAM, star, transistors, virtual, and volatile. Let's see. Solid state storage is, this means that the data is not lost when the power is turned off. So, the solid state storage is non-volatile. So, this will be the number one. Next one, solid state storage is made of transistors, right? It doesn't have any moving parts. And they are laid out in a grid. It's a grid shape, like you can think of it. It's like this. You have rows and columns, okay? Next one is the gates are used to control the flow of what? Flow of electrons. Okay, this is the next option. Electrons through the transistor. This changes the data in transistor from 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1. First option is non-volatile. Okay. Second one is transistors. Third one is grid. And the fourth one is electrons. Okay, these are the answers. Option D. The photographer compresses an image file before it is emailed. Give one reason why a file is compressed. Uh, less bandwidth required for transmission. Second reason is reduce the file size. And the third one is reduce storage space required. These are the different reasons why we compress the file. Question number five. A website allows users to purchase items. Computer A sends a request 
for the home page to the website server. Question A, the, the request is sent using the packet switching, okay? The structure of the packet of data has three elements. Uh, one element is the packet header. Okay, question number one, identify two items of data contained in a packet header. What we have in the packet header? We have destination address, we have originator IP address, okay? And we have the packet number. These are the information that we have inside the packet header. Let's see the question number two. Identify two other elements of a packet. Okay. First one is the packet header. Let's see. This is the packet, how the packet looks like. So we have three different elements. First one is the header. Second one is the payload. Third one is the trailer or the footer. Okay. We have payload and the trailer. These are two other elements of a packet. Let's move to the next question. Computer A needs to be directly connected to a router that is located in a different room. Uh, tick one box to identify whether a serial data transmission or the parallel data transmission is more suitable for this connection. The first reason is data writes in the order it is sent. Okay. Second reason is less likely to experience interference. Okay. And the third reason is less likely to have the errors. Next, let's move to the next question. The connection will also use full duplex data transmission. Define the full duplex data transmission. What is full duplex transmission? We have three types of data transmission, right? We have simplex, we have half duplex, and we have the full duplex. In the full duplex, data can flow from A to B and from B to A along the same transmission line at the same time, right? And the example of uh, the full duplex is the mobile phone communication. You use the phone call, party A and party B, they can talk at the same time. And you can also think of the, the full duplex as a two-way road where the traffic can go uh, in two, in two directions at the same time. Option C, the data transmission will use parity checks. The byte needs to be sent using an even parity byte check. Okay, we're using even parity byte check. Complete the parity bit each byte. Okay, in the even parity bit, we need to see if the number of ones are even, we'll use zero as the parity bit. If the number of one, they are odd, we'll use one as the parity bit. Okay. Let's count the number of one in the byte A. We have one, two, three, and four. We have already even number of ones in this parity. We'll use zero as a parity bit. In the byte B, we have all zeros, right? We don't need to use one. We just use the zero here. This will be the answer for zero. Question number two, a parity block check can be used instead of parity byte check. Okay. Explain how a parity block check might detect an error in the transmission that would not be detected by the parity byte check. Okay. Let's see. And the parity byte check cannot detect even number of changes and if the bits are interchanged. Okay. We have two things. If even bits are changed or the bits are interchanged. For example, if you have those two bits, those two zeros turn into one. In this case, the parity byte won't be able to detect if there is an error or not. Okay. Or let's say two bits, they are interchanged. For example, this one change with this zero okay this zero become one and this one become zero in this case the parity byte will also fail to tell if there is an error the parity block and the parity byte can be used together to check if an error has occurred and where the error is located we can use the parity block and parity byte together to to locate the errors to pinpoint the error question number three the data was sent using an even parity block check okay one of the bit has been transmitted incorrectly and we need to find that bit. So let's find how we can check if the bit is transmitted incorrectly. We need to see the number of one. If the number of one in one byte are even, mean the byte transmitted correctly. If the number of one in one byte are odd, this means the byte transmitted incorrect. So let's first examine the byte zero. Byte zero, we have one, two, three, and four. Four is an even number. This means this transmitted correctly. Next one, byte number one, we have one and two. Two is an even number. We can use the zero as a parity bit. This is also correct. This is also correct. Next, byte number two. Byte number two is one, two, three, and four. Four is an even number. No problem. Next, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is an even number. This is also transmitted correctly. Byte number four, one, two, and three. Three is not an even number. So this means there is some problem here. Okay. Byte number four transmitted incorrect, but we need to pinpoint which bit is transmitted incorrectly. Okay, let's see the byte number five. Byte number five, all zero, no problem. And byte number six, we have two and four. 
four is an even number, no problem. Okay. Next one, the last bit, let's see. We have one, two, three, and four. Four is an even number, no problem in this one. Okay. So now let's check the vertically. The first bit, okay. So one, two, three, four. Four is an even number. Next one is one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is an even number, no problem here. Okay. Next one is one, two, two is an even number, no problem here. One, two, three, four, four is an even number, so also no problem here. One, two, two is an even number, no problem here. Let's move to the next one, one, two, and three, three is an odd number, so it means there is a problem here. Now we can tell that this bit, this bit here, bit number six has changed, okay? This is the error. Let's see the last one, bit number seven is one, two is two, is no problem here. Our answer will be byte number four, okay, and bit number six, this one. That's the answer. The answer is bit six and byte four, transmitted incorrectly. Let's move to the next question, part D. The website allows the user to set up an account to log on and purchase items. The website is accessed and displayed using a web browser. Two functions of the web browser are to render hypertext markup language or HTML to display web pages and store the cookies. Identify two other functions of a web browser. Okay. We have the storing or bookmarking. This is another feature of the, the web browser. Second one is the storing history. Browser can also store the history. And the third one is allow the multiple tab or you can open multiple websites in same window. These are the other features of the web browser. Question number two, identify two ways that cookies can be used to enhance the user experience of this website. Cookies can use, store the preferences. The user does not have to select their preferences each time they visit the website. Okay. Second one is storing account details. The user does not have to member or enter their username and the password each time they visit the website and the third way is storing recent purchases okay but to allow the user to quickly reorder more items these are the the things that cookies can help uh, question number six a company is involved in robotics one of its robots is designed to make a specific movement depending on a binary value the table gives some of the movements for the robot. Complete the table by writing the missing binary, denary, or hexadecimal value for each movement. First one, let's see the move forward. Well, let's convert this binary number to the hexadecimal. How many ones we have? One, two, three. Four ones. I guess four one is what? 15 and one. 15 is what? 15 is that. The answer will be one and F. Next one, we have 40. 140, 140 divided by 2, we can convert it to the binary. 1, 4, 0 divided by 2. 70 divided by 2. 35 divided by 2. 8. And then 8. 4, 2, and one. If the number is even, the reminder is zero. If the number is odd, the reminder is one. Okay. One, zero, and this is also zero. The answer will be we can write from top to bottom. Okay. One, triple zero. Then double one, double zero. Double one and double zero. Describe what is meant by robotics. Robotics, an area of computer science that looks at the creation and the uses of robots that are used to enhance our working and personal lives. That is the definition of the robotics. Next question, uh, part C. The robot has a sensor and a microprocessor. The robot will move forward continuously until it detects an object that is less than or equal to 10 centimeters in front of it. If an object is less than or equal to 10 cm in front of it, the robot turns 90 degrees right. It then tries to move forward again. Explain how the sensor and microprocessor are used to automate this robot. Here are the steps. Uses an infrared or proximity sensor. Continuously send 
tensor reading to a microprocessor, microprocessor compares reading with a 10 centimeter threshold. If the threshold is greater than 10 centimeter, command the robot to move forward. If the threshold is less than or equal to equal to 10 centimeter, command the robot to turn. Use an actuator for a robot movement. Repeat the process until the robot is stopped. Let's move to the next question. Uh, the robot needs to find its way through different puzzles. Each puzzle has a series of paths that the robot needs to follow to find its way to the end of the puzzle. The puzzle contains dead ends and obstacles. The robots need to decide which way to go. The robot program uses artificial intelligence or AI. Describe the characteristic of AI. AI has the ability to reason. AI learn and adopt, including the learning from the mistake. AI can make predictions and decisions based on the data. And number four is AI is skilled in recognizing and analyzing patterns. Question number two. Explain how the program will use AI. Number one, collect the data where it has been to make sure it does not repeat the same incorrect route. Okay. Second one, collect data about obstacles, problem. It knows how to react to the obstacle next time. Number three, store successful and unsuccessful actions. It knows what is most likely to work next time. That's it. We are done with this paper. See you in the next class. Bye.